Welcome to Talk Africa. I am Penina Karibe. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's tour has taken him to five nations this past few days. We'll pick out the highlights for you in a few moments. The visit is the first by an international leader this year. But as we know, Africa is in growing demand as a venue for official visits. Last May, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang made stops in Ethiopia, Nigeria, Angola and Kenya. His trip promoted the theme of China-Africa friendship and he also pledged China's support for Africa playing a larger role in world politics. America has been trying to strengthen relations with Africa. Some would argue it's trying to catch up with the Chinese. Secretary of State John Kerry also visited Ethiopia and Angola, the DR Congo and South Sudan too. Now later, last year in November, French President Francois Hollande visited West Africa. He won plaudits for being the first Western leader to visit the Ebola-stricken region, but he also drew criticism after urging African leaders to learn from the toppling of Blaise Compa power in Burkina Faso. Rwanda accused him of trying to impose France's idea of democracy. Now we have plenty of powerful leaders keen to strengthen relations. So what makes Wang Yi's visit so special? My colleague Kofam Renje has that report. The main aim of this tour to strengthen ties between Beijing and its allies in Africa to discuss trade, investment and to seek broader cooperation. But there was another message too. Some critics have accused China of merely using Africa to secure its natural resources. Wang Yi took the opportunity to hit back. In China's exchanges and cooperation with Africa, we want to seek mutual benefit and win-win results. I want to make clear here one point. That is, China will never follow the beaten track of Western colonialists, and our cooperation with Africa will never come at the expense of ecology, environment, or long-term interests of Africa. Minister Wang began his visit in Kenya. China wants greater engagement with East Africa's largest economy. It's already a big investor. The $600 million expansion of Kenya's main airport is just one of a string of infrastructure projects it's involved in. China says more than half of its foreign aid goes to Africa, with no strings attached. One reason why African countries increasingly are looking east. Economic partnership was also high on the agenda with Cameroon's leader, Paul Beer. In Equatorial Guinea, Wang assured President Teodoro Biangwema that China will help the country's industrialization while promoting sustainable development. And in Kinshasa, Wang outlined plans for greater cooperation, particularly in farming, mining, and infrastructure. In Khartoum, he was involved in a peace summit between the warring factions in South Sudan. China actually helped organize the summit. It's been trying to broker a peace in South Sudan for a year. A busy start to the new year for the foreign minister. But above all, Wang has shown that China is determined to step up its involvement in Africa on all levels. Kofam Renje, CCTV, Nairobi, Kenya. With us on Talk Africa today are Professor Antoni van Niekerk, a foreign and security policy analyst in Johannesburg, South Africa. From Cairo is Gamal Zaida, a columnist and managing editor at Al Ahram. And here in studio is Professor Masharia Munen, an African politics and international relations analyst. Thank you all gentlemen for joining us. Professor Munen, let me begin with you. It's been tradition in China's diplomacy for the past 25 years that every beginning of the year, the foreign minister for his first trip abroad visits the African continent and obviously sending the message that China's relationship with Africa is a vital cornerstone in China's diplomacy. How much has the, con uh, the continent benefited from these visits? Well, there is the <coughs> issue of the um, importance being placed on Africa by China. Mm. It's also a message not just to Africa but across the, the globe that Africa is an important area in the international politics, that uh, when it's placed at the top, then uh, it's not to be ignored. On the side of the Africans, it feels good that somebody is paying attention instead of Africa being placed at the bottom of the ladder all the time. Now you have a major power that considers Africa to be so critical that it should be at the top. 
And what happens is that both sides then get right from the beginning to assess what it is that needs to be done on both sides so that they all benefit. If the points of convergence are clear, you move on. Mm. If there are differences that need to be sorted out, it's not very early, and then you can harmonize those things. So it is a very positive move on the part of the Chinese, and the effect is to uplift the status of China on the African continent, who also find it necessary to place China at the top of their foreign policy agenda instead of somewhere else. Right. So reciprocity mm. comes in. Uh, um, Gamal, coming to you there in Cairo, there is obviously what Professor Munene is saying, a feel-good factor here in Africa, that you, you're topping someone else's agenda, the priority list. But uh, what are the benefits that on the ground are being seen uh, out of this mutual friendship the two sides have? Uh, uh, let me uh, tell you uh, uh, at the beginning uh, uh, that uh, uh, Africa represents 3% uh, 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 of the uh, global uh, Chinese uh, uh, investments and 5% of the uh, global uh, Chinese uh, trade. Uh, so uh, Africa, when it comes to trade and investment, doesn't represent too much of the uh, overall uh, trade and investments in uh, China uh, with the rest of the world. But uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, China, of course, has uh, a, a policy, has a national interest uh, uh, in Africa, uh, uh, and trying uh, very hard to satisfy that. Uh, but at the same time, is trying to benefit the African uh, continent when it comes to uh, development regarding uh, trade regarding infrastructure. We see here uh, mutual uh, and common interest between uh, uh, China and uh, Africa. Right, so let's pick it up from where Gamal has left. Uh, coming to you there in Johannesburg, Professor Antoni. While he was here in Kenya, I had an interview with him. And let me just quote some of the few things he mentioned. He said, and I'm quoting, that politically, we always pick up for African countries and uphold justice. Economically, we help African countries to enhance development to achieve prosperity. Now, just how reassured should the continent be by these remarks? Well, uh, let me start by saying that I agree with my two colleagues in Cairo and uh, they're in the studio with you, that China is emerging as an even more important global player and uh, an ally of Africa, of the African continent, as the global economy is shifting from north to south and from, uh, from west to east. So uh, we should pay particular attention to the policy approaches that the Chinese have uh, executed in the past couple of years. And I think it's important to listen very carefully to the foreign minister's policy pronouncements. Uh, I think Africa is important for China primarily for developmental purposes. We have much to learn from China as an emerging global power. And Africa has much to give in terms of scarce resources that emerging economies need to grow their economies. Mm. Uh, now, of course, there's competition globally for Africa's uh, uh, value, and we have lots of value, we have lots to offer as a continent to the global economy and to global peace and security. And there is competition. Uh, the EU is still interested in Africa. Uh, so are the Americans. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, 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 discount the Brazilians either. Mm. But I must say that the Chinese appear to, uh, to engage with us in Africa on a different level. They are quite open and straightforward with what they put on the table. And we have a structured engagement now. We have a mechanism to pursue this, which is the FOCAC uh, arrangement, uh, of which will meet uh, next year or this year in South Africa. And that gives us the opportunity to put on the agenda the issues that matter to us most. So it's not a question of the Chinese telling us what they think is important. It is an engagement between Africans and Chinese uh, in the common interest of both entities. Professor Monene coming to you, there was also something that Minister Wang uh, said during his visit, especially here in Kenya when I talked to him, that um, hit global headlines. And he did say that China will never follow in the track of Western colonialists. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, the... 
the message is that China would not uh, knowingly or deliberately engage in explo exploitative practices. Uh, the Western colonialists were very good at exploitation of Africa, just siphoning things out, both materially and also mentally. And uh, I guess the minister was saying it would not engage in that exploitative uh, undertaking, which is a very assuring thing for the Africans because the experience of total exploitation, not just um, taking things, but actually creating poverty, because colonialism was poverty creation for the purposes of enriching somebody else. And uh, what the Chinese are saying is that they would not do that uh, kind of thing. The challenge is on the side of the Africans to study the Chinese. Um, we give credit to the Chinese because I think they have done their homework. They've done it very well. And uh, the onus is on the African side to also study not just the Chinese, but everybody else, and to study themselves well. Mm. So that, as uh, Professor Anthony was saying, when you come to the negotiating table, we all know what you are talking about. The Africans put their um, agenda in front, the Chinese put their agenda, we meet. Where there is a convergence of interest, we, de we talk. Where there is a, div a divergence, we know. And we all agree that there is a divergence. Then the question is what to do about the differences. But it should be on a mutuality as opposed to exploitation. And I think that when the minister was saying that China will not follow that Western path mm -hmm. of poverty creation and exploitation, it's a very positive statement that should be taken on its face value. And then everybody should then follow it up and prepare to act properly. Right. So we, we Professor, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, like I mentioned, while he was here, expounded on this cooperation between China and Africa. Let's just take a listen to what he said. China and Africa have much to offer each other in economic development, given each side's distinctive advantages and demands. Both offer each other development opportunities. We know that Kenyan and other African countries are implementing the Look East strategy and seek to enhance mutually beneficial cooperation with China. On our part, China is accelerating the implementation of westward openness strategy and seek to increase out outbound investment and industrial relocation. I have a strong sense that now China and Africa face historical opportunities to dovetail our development strategies so as to create bigger space for our cooperation and achieve greater development for both sides. It is our sincere hope that through our deeper cooperation, we will translate our traditional friendship to the driving force for common development and that we will turn the human resources and natural resources in Africa to the actual and tangible economic advantages for this continent. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi discussing the partnership that China and Africa enjoys and that, for, that forms our discussion today on Talk Africa. We do have Professor Antoni Vanikak, a foreign and security policy analyst joining us live from Johannesburg in Cairo, uh, in, in South Africa, sorry. In Cairo is Gamal Zaida, a columnist and managing editor at Al Haram. And here in studio is Professor Masharia Munene. He is an African politics and international relations analyst. You're watching Talk Africa. We shall be right back after this short break.
Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi just concluded his visit of Africa. And during that time, he talked about China's efforts in assisting the African continent fight the Ebola epidemic. Take a listen. The Ebola epidemic has caused a huge damage to the three Western African countries. I believe we need to think uh, one thing, that is how to address both the symptoms and root causes of the epidemic and to enhance the capacity of African countries in disease prevention so that such an epidemic will not happen again. Therefore, looking forward, a priority area of China-Africa cooperation is to help build better public health systems in Africa and enhance disease prevention capabilities on this continent. Well, let me make it clear that as long as the disease, the epidemic has not ended, China will not stop our assistance and support for African countries. We will stand firmly together with our brothers in these three Western African countries and the rest of the countries on this continent to fight till the very end of this epidemic. And with us still here on Talk Africa today are Professor Antonio von Nikak, a foreign and security policy analyst in Johannesburg, South Africa. From Cairo, we have Gamal Zaida, a columnist and managing editor at Al Ahram. And here in studio is Professor Masharia Munene, an African politics and international relations analyst. Gamal, there in Cairo, let me come to you. How significant has China's contribution to the fight against Ebola been? Uh, the initiatives that came from the Western world regarding the group of 20 uh, to help Africa, and nothing has uh, come out of uh, all the talks of the Western leaders regarding uh, uh, supporting uh, the African economies or fighting diseases. Uh, and we see, I mean, the uh, Ebola. Uh, epidemic is spreading everywhere and uh, we see as well uh, uh, China is giving a big hand uh, to uh, the African countries in this regard right all right so let, let's let's go to Johannesburg uh, professor Antoni you had the foreign minister uh, there speaking about the kind of response they've offered to the fight against Ebola uh, what kind of expertise is China bringing to this fight Well, I must say, you know, first off, that uh, there's no denying the fact that Africans benefit enormously from the very close cooperation with China. And the example that the foreign minister made of the fight against Ebola is, is a good example of how we benefit directly. And I must say that the tone of his presentation is, um, is inspirational and visionary and is very different from the tired old uh, language and discourse that we hear from, uh, from Western countries. So in that sense, we welcome this uh, engagement. Uh, it's not only in the area of health that we benefit uh, directly. There's also the question of economic uh, and socioeconomic development, uh, which through cooperation assists Africans generally to begin to build and strengthen the institutions and the skills that we need to really participate in a better way in the global economy. So in that sense, uh, China is an ally and a partner and has been historically so uh, for a long time. However, I want to say, if you will allow me, that uh, I, I have a sense that the Chinese know Africa and Africans better than we know China or the Chinese. Uh, the, the relationship that we are building here must be of a two-way street and not only us being beneficiaries or recipients of largesse and goodwill from the Chinese side. There's a lot of homework that needs to be done by ourselves, whether it's through the AU or the sub-regional organizations or as uh, country specific, to understand what opportunities and challenges there are in engaging the Chinese or the Asians more generally. You might even want to use the BRICS framework to see how we can cooperate in the global economy in a, in a much more uh, direct manner. 
Right. So let, let's also talk about something that Professor Antoni had mentioned earlier on in this discussion, and that's the issue of insecurity and conflict here in Africa. And when Foreign Minister Wang Yi was here, he did talk about the conflict specifically in South Sudan. Take a listen. Uh, we know that South Sudan has been a major hotspot issue and has drawn a lot of attention from the international community. Now that I'm going to Sudan, the issue of South Sudan is a must topic. And as requested by some of our friends, together we will hold a special consultation to support EGAD-led peace process on South Sudan. This special consultation will be chaired by EGAD's chief mediator, Ambassador Sayum Mesfin, and relevant parties directly involved in the conflict in South Sudan will also take part. We want to make good use of our traditional friendly relations with both Sudan and South Sudan and our contacts with all the relevant parties to encourage the efforts of EGAD and lend impetus to their mediation efforts. And as such, we hope that we will contribute to the peaceful settlement of the conflicts in South Sudan, to the interests of all the people in South Sudan, and the common interests of Sudan, Kenya, other African countries, and the international community as a whole. Well, the foreign minister did indeed meet with IGAD and the warring parties in the South Sudan conflict on Monday. Professor Munene, coming to you, how influential is China in these negotiations? China is critical to the negotiation, and I think they also they almost reached a deal, which was a very positive thing, that uh, his contribution there did bring some of these people to the talking table to a point where they say, we think we can get somewhere. So it is critical and important to the welfare. In fact, we can say that China and Africa, particularly Kenya, they do have direct interest in the well-being of the Sudanese, both South and, uh, and North, because when they have a problem there, Kenyans suffer. And uh, of course, the Chinese also feel it because they also have investments in the place. So, Generally, the Chinese have been reaching out. Uh, the question that comes up, have the African states been ready to embrace the reach out? And in embracing the, reach out, the reaching out, uh, what China is trying to be, as much as possible, to be a responsible power, because it is a power. And it has to be concerned with whatever happens in the, the rest of the world, because it has a direct inf impact, uh, impact on their own way. The other side is, what is it that we can get from China? And, uh, and this calls for strategic mm -hmm. borrowing. Not borrowing, not taking everything, but exactly what will be of value to various African countries. And their method of handling particular public health, and that's what they are bringing into the Ebola issue, is uh, how do they manage public health? And then, uh, because manage 1.3 billion people uh, in a healthy way is something. So, you know, there is something for everybody and to, they reach out, we also reach out, but we borrow from each other strategically, not embracing everything, because to embrace everything would be foolish. Right. Yeah. Gamal, coming to you there in Cairo, previously we've seen a policy of non-interference from China, but now we're seeing China sending 700 troops to South Sudan to place peacekeeping. Uh, we've, of course, had the foreign minister saying that this is a role that needs to be taken up by a responsible power. So are we seeing a review or a change of policy? I, uh, I mean, uh, when I talk from an Egyptian perspective, uh, when we see uh, one of the former uh, colonial powers interfere in, uh, in Africa, uh, we start uh, at once be skeptical uh, and we ask about what are the objectives of the uh, uh, engagement of some of Western countries like uh, the United States uh, 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 in some African issues. Uh, right. uh, but when it comes to China, uh, we do expect uh, a lot when it comes to uh, uh, settling peace in a country like Sudan or in any other uh, 
African country. Right. Let's let's go to Johannesburg now. Professor Antoni, we did see China saying that their involvement in the South Sudan conflict is absolutely an altruistic act. That's what they said. Now we do know they have a presence in Mali. So are we likely to see a lot a lot of more more of these engagements as far as conflict in the continent is concerned? Yeah. I, I, I don't know if your guests will agree with me, but uh, it's not difficult to work out that uh, great powers uh, expand their power and influence and, um, and offer military cooperation where their national interests are at stake. So it's pretty clear to me that China has strategic interests in part of Africa, and it makes sense, it's a logical conclusion that they would want to protect their interests. I want to say as well, that uh, in the area or terrain of peace and security, if I'm just very practical and not ideological, I want to say that Africans need to build capacity and we need to strike uh, relationships with credible partners to assist uh, us in, in building that capacity. The EU is doing that with the AU, but there are uh, numerous problems with that relationship. Uh, and we are looking to other partners, and I think the Chinese and the BRICS alliance comes to mind, where we need to develop uh, personnel, procedures, practices, and operational effectiveness in dealing, preventing crises, managing them, and rebuilding states wherever uh, that is needed. And it seems to me, again, that the approach that the Chinese take uh, is an enlightened one, it's also an informed one. They have studied the AU and the sub-regional organizations. They are working with IGAD. I would not be surprised if in future they uh, find a way to work with ECOWAS uh, and other uh, sub-regional organizations to deal this growing threat of terror in North Africa, but that we also see playing out in Kenya and elsewhere. Right. Uh, I'm speaking from a South African perspective, and I'm hoping that at some point SADC will also benefit from deeper uh, security cooperation with China. All right, and Professor Morena, quickly, as we wrap up, what next for this cooperation moving forward? Mutual trust is needed to continue being. We need to learn from each other, particularly the Africans. Learn to, uh, they need to study China very well. And then uh, borrow strategically from the Chinese. And agreeing with Pro Professor Anthony, it is national interest. The Chinese are advancing their national interest the best way they know how, and they're succeeding. Mm. The Africans also need to do the same thing. We should not be under an illusion that uh, there are things that are just done out of the ordinary. The interests that are being advanced is a question. It is in the Chinese interest to ensure that there is security, there is peace everywhere, so that they can deal with people in a more respectable way, in a, in a friendly way. Okay. They can cut deals, they can develop. They can support each other politically. And the relations between China and Africa is not just material, it's also political. All right. And both will gain. All right. Yeah. Professor, thanks very much for that. We had on Talk Africa today, Professor Antoni Fantnika, a foreign and security policy analyst in Johannesburg, South Africa, from Cairo. We had Gamal Zaida, a columnist and managing editor at Al Ahram. And here in studio was Professor Masheria Monene, an African politics and international relations analyst. It's been Talk Africa for this week. I am Penina Karibe. Thank you for watching.